Leadership is the art of giving people a platform for spreading ideas that work. Welcome to DC Local Leaders, the podcast where we talk to C-suite leaders within the DC area. Our guests share their pathways to success and the important moments that impacted their careers. Lean in as we get the inside scoop on how they are shaping their industries, how they lead, manage, and connect with others. From the sectors of aerospace, defense, tech, IT, and more, this is Local Leaders. Your host has been making meaningful connections with industry leaders for over 15 years. Here's Philip Nathrum. All right, welcome back. Welcome back to the DC Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Nathrum, and uh, we've got some exciting things happening. Uh, the DC Local Leaders Podcast has recently partnered with NVTC, that's Northern Virginia Tech Council. Uh, we will be doing a, a digital series. It's going to be offered digitally. It will be broadcast here on the DC Local Leaders Podcast as well as iHeartMedia. The name of the series is Talk Tech, and we're going to do exactly that. We're going to talk to tech leaders throughout the year once a month on a Friday morning and uh, just bring you that conversation. We're going to get to know in an intimate way, a lot like what we do here at DC Local Leaders, but these are specific members of NVTC, and uh, they're doing some incredible things, and we are really grateful. We're grateful that we've been asked to partner with them to to launch that mission and to kind of share those ideas. So keep tuning in. Keep looking forward to that. There will be plenty of uh, information coming out on all of our social media channels. That's Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, wherever you can find us, definitely here, wherever you happen to be listening, whether it's Apple, Spotify. Please remember to uh, follow and subscribe so that you don't miss uh, miss any episodes. You can also listen to us on Notecast. If you're unfamiliar with Notecast, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a podcast listening app that allows you to take notes. You simply tap the screen, and it will make a digital copy of the note in the form of an audio clip, and it will also transcribe it and email that clip to you so you'll never miss the message many of our listeners listen while they're in the car or they're doing something around the house it makes it really easy just tap the screen make the note whether it's a book recommendation a person you'd like to get to know a 360 review recommendation whatever it happens to be you can take that note with notecast so check out notecast if you're not already familiar um yeah, and we're starting, like I said, we're starting off this uh, Women in Leadership series, and today is with Talia Washington. If you don't know Talia, she is the Executive Director of Higher Achievement. Higher Achievement is a nonprofit organization. They have an office right here in D.C. They've just expanded into Prince George's County, Maryland, and into Alexandria, Virginia, and they are actively working to bridge the education gap here in Washington, D.C., um, she talks about the huge opportunity gap in education that exists right here in our nation's capital and what she's been doing throughout her entire career and her entire life to lean into that passion of hers for education and teaching and to do something about it. And she just shares a, 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 you know, a journey of hers as she continues to learn from other people around her and how she applies that to her daily life. So um, really, really looking forward to sharing this with you. Listen till the end if you'd like to get in touch with her to learn more about higher achievement and what they do and how you can also help to contribute. So let's get into the episode. All right, we're back with another episode of DC Local Leaders. And today... We are here with Talia Washington from Higher Achievement. How are you doing, Talia? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I know that uh, we're in a weird time. And so we're doing a nonprofit series. And generally, it's been people in the tech and the defense industry. And, you know, we've just been capturing some incredible stories of people that have, they found themselves in a position of leadership where some of them just didn't know that that's what they wanted to do. They didn't know that they expected to be there, but they got there. Others are just entrepreneurial and they, they knew they set out to do this. With the nonprofit series, what we've noticed about people that, that the leadership of nonprofits care so much about their mission. And there's usually a huge personal story that leads up to that. And today, I'd just love to talk to you a little bit about yours and how you got here and, and what it means to you, what higher achievement is and, and, and why you're so passionate about what you do. Sure. Well, thanks. 
Um, I think I'll start by sharing a little bit about higher achievement and our mission, and then I can tell you what attracted me and how I found myself in this field of work. Yeah, that'd be great. So, um, higher achievement is an after school academic enrichment and mentoring program. We were founded here in Washington, DC over 40 years ago, 45 plus years now in operation. We serve, um, high need middle school students. So typically the middle school students we serve um, attend a public school in the region. They uh, themselves or the school that they attend um, primarily qualifies them for free or reduced meals, which is the federal um, proxy measure for an indicator of poverty. So often we are working in the most high need communities across the region. Higher Achievement serves about 500 middle school students. We have six locations in DC, one in Alexandria, Virginia, and just last year we expanded to Prince George's County, Maryland. So we serve students at Greenbelt Middle School. So we are truly um, serving across the Beltway, around the Beltway. And um, we are an academic program, so we focus very much on education. And I have always worked in education. So Higher Achievement is a nonprofit, but specifically I work in the K to 12 education space and mm. always have. Mm. So I am now 20 years into this work. I started as a public school classroom teacher right out of college. So yeah, I'm, right here in Washington, DC, right? Yeah, I'm local. Uh, I grew up here in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I attended University of Maryland College Park. Go graduated. Terps. I'm a very proud Terrapin. And after I graduated, I you know, I was faced with the choice like so many graduates are about what would come next, what kind of career path I wanted. And I had spent a lot of time as a campus student, as a leader. Um, I was an activist on campus. I was a leader. I uh, volunteered. I tutored students. I really wanted to have my nine to five job um, be about making change, making the world a better place. It sounds idealistic. So many of us are in college, but I really wanted once I graduated that I spend my nine to five time helping to make the world more of what I wanted to see. So you were doing all this even even then and at the University of Maryland. At the University of Maryland as a student, as a volunteer, you know, yeah. my, like all students, my primary job was to be a student. Right. Um, but, you know, we spent so much time uh, organizing, so much time talking about the, the world we wanted to see. And I, I thought graduation was an opportunity to actually stop talking about it and do something about it. And so I became a teacher. Um, I actually didn't teach here in the D.C. area. I moved to the Bronx. So I relocated and taught first grade in, so you were in New York the for, Bronx. Yes, yeah. I relocated. I knew nobody. I had zero connections to New York City, but I wanted to be in the city. Did you um, move by yourself? You just I graduated did. college and picked up? I joined a program called Teach for America 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, now people know what that is. I can like, I can say Teach for America and people know or have some sort of sense of what that is 20 years ago. Nobody knew what, what that is was. What is it? Is it, is it like the Peace Corps version for teachers or like? Very something? similar. Yeah. That's a, that's a good, that's a good way to summarize it. It is, um, it is a movement of people who are choosing to teach in high need communities, either urban and rural across the country. So it is, um, based here in the U.S. And you you become a teacher. You teach. You go where you're most needed. Um, and I was in the classroom for two years as a first grade public school teacher in the Bronx. So I relocated based on where I was most needed. Um, I learned. I taught. And that was 20 years ago. I have been in education ever since. So it was my entree into public education and not just education, but the fact that there is an opportunity gap based on race and income in our public education system. What does that mean? When we say that there's an ap opportunity gap, what do we refer, like, what do, what do you mean by that? Um, you know, for a long time, people referred to it as an achievement gap. At Higher Achievement, we prefer to focus on the opportunity gap. Um, and, you know, that really, that, can, that means all kinds of things, but essentially it means that there are like many things in our country. And I think as a country, we're having a broader conversation now, not just about education, but about the disparities in access to opportunity and outcomes on all kinds of factors. We talk about healthcare, access to housing and jobs and living wage jobs. Well, in the K to 12 system, you know, all those things, all those things are things that we talk about as adults, ac disparities in education, uh, disparities in access to those things as adults. But in the K to 12 public education system, we see disparities based on race and based on income and sometimes the intersection of those two, race and income, the access to the quality of education that young people have based on their zip code, their race, and the way those things intersect. So, um. So Teachers for America, is that, was that the name of Teach it? Teach for America? Teach for America? Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, Teach for America 
explicitly. So lots of people become teachers um, because they love young people. They have a talent for helping um, connect with young people and teach content and help, you know, young people um, access opportunity. Teach for America specifically aims explicitly at the opportunity gap, right. at the race and economic based opportunity gap, that there is a disparity in the outcome a young person of color might experience in their public school and based on the zip code, the income level of their family or the community in which they live, and that that is not only not okay, but that that is something that can be overcome with really strong teaching and a focus on the policies that support the teachers and the classrooms and the schools and the communities that don't have the same access to quality public schooling. It is not enough to say that everyone has access to public schools, that we are acknowledging that there are disparities and that we are working explicitly and intentionally to close those disparities for young people. So their, their main mission was to try to solve that problem. And you were a part of that, even right right out of school. Right out of school. that the, It spoke to me that there was an opportunity to both teach, to work with young people, and to do it explicitly focused on closing what was an unfair opportunity gap. I, I, um, I'm a first-generation American. My, I was born and raised here in the D.C. area. My family's from Trinidad. They immigrated here as adults. And education was always a huge... Um, mm-hmm. Not just a goal, but um, means to an end. That education was the path towards a better outcome. You know, and from my parents' viewpoint, um, for all of the, their children, for me and my siblings. Did you have good grades when you were when you were younger? Were they were they hard on you about that? Like you must. I ha- so I have three. There are three of us. I yeah. am the oldest. Okay. I am also the only girl. Okay. Um, and I often talk about the fact that there are three siblings, and we have three very different life outcomes. And I do very much believe that the reason we have those different outcomes, we were raised in the mm-hmm. same household. Uh, education, we had really different experiences in school. So I was a good student for sure. I enjoyed school. I loved reading. I loved learning. And I always knew that college was the path for me. And I always knew that I was ambitious and wanted to put the talents that I had and the skills that I gained to use to be successful. I didn't know what success, you know, I didn't have a, a specific definition of what that would look like, but I knew that education was the path to that for me. And I, I had a pretty, I don't want to say easy time in school, but School clicked. It always made sense. I mm-hmm. fit in. It was it was a place of comfort and a source of um, confidence and skill building for me. And I have brothers who have had a different experience. School was not the place that they found comfort. It was not a place that built them up as young people, certainly not as young brown people in a public school system. And we have we had different paths. We had different outcomes. Mm-hmm. So I have I, I finished college. I've gone on to graduate school. I have a brother who started college and did not finish, and then a brother who just ultimately opted out, did not even make it into college. And we have really different life outcomes based on that. And I and I do think, you know, it, it wasn't that school was easy for me, but I, I did see a path for myself, and I felt welcomed and affirmed in a public school system mm-hmm. that 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 I don't think treated my siblings the same. Yeah, and it sounds like you had a passion for education, you know, even from a young age, but you were able to see, you know, the difference... Um, in, in an experience in education, even from a young age, and you grew up with that. And, and it's it's not a surprise that you take the passion that you do into education. And I had educators who believed in me, who explicitly yeah. told me that, you know, I had skills, I had talents that they saw, you know, they saw a path for success for me. And that was very much motivating me as a teacher myself. Um, you know, my husband and I were just talking about this. We were comparing the first time either of us had a teacher of color in our K-12 experience. I did not have a teacher of color until I got to high school. And I grew up right here in the, in the D.C. area. Um, but it was high school. It was the first time I had a teacher of color. And so for me, it was really meaningful that I was a first grade public school teacher. It was one of the first experiences that students mm. who came through our big public school in New York City had. I'm still in touch with one, sometimes two, <laughs> mostly one of my students from when I was a first grade teacher. And, you know, that bond, I think, and that ability to see a teacher in the classroom who looks like you, who believes in you, who tells you explicitly that you have potential and confidence and skills and then actually builds the skills in you to help make school a success is it can be life changing and path changing, I think. for you. So did you find you found mentorship with your teachers? It wasn't just education, it sounds like they weren't just teaching you the curriculum. They were actually coaching you on, you know, on life skills. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think by the time I got to high school and then certainly in college, yeah, educators make a big difference in how you see yourself, how you see what's possible. 
you know, at Higher Achievement, we work with middle school students, and we we are not teachers. We are we, we are we, we are an after school program. We think of ourselves as youth developers, so we operate in the space after school. Um, so essentially, you know, between three and eight p.m., which is a especially for middle school, it's a particularly precarious time for middle school students. Um, you why, know, why is that? Like, what are you saying? There's what happens during the school day, and then middle school. You know, middle school students are not young children. They're not like getting on the bus and going right home and under a parent or caregiver supervision all the time. They're also not high school students um, or college students with the agency of being, you know, teenagers. Mm-hmm. They are exactly as they sound, middle school students, right? Yeah. And if if you take a minute and think back, I know I can think back to middle school. We know developmentally, it's a it's a particularly critical time. Um, peer pressure is at its height in middle school. Puberty is at its height yeah. in middle school. And now with with social media, I social think media is a whole added imagine. dimension. Yeah. Absolutely. So just you know, just by definition, middle school students are kind of they're they're in the middle. They have they're just starting to form independence. It's when many adults in in young people's lives start giving them more independence or pulling back. You're starting to form your own identity. And peer pressure, like undoubtedly, is at its height. We also know that brain development at middle school, um, at the middle school age, you know, um, at the adolescent brain, there's all kinds of documentation. I'm by no means an expert, but at Higher Achievement, we do try to both acknowledge and use the fact that middle school brains are developing at this very rapid pace. And the, there's peer pressure, and peer pressure we tend to think of as a negative influence, but the power of peers can be really positive as well. And so at Higher Achievement, we are both trying to capture the fact that their after school hours are particularly precarious, that positive peer pressure can be a really motivating factor. And when we can put our arms around young people in the after school time, in the middle school age, and surround them with positive peers, with a positive and caring adult influence, and really work towards helping young people develop their voice, recognize their agency, and then put those skills to work academically to pave the way for success in middle school, and then therefore in college, in high school, and then in college, that the combination of peer pressure and that like really malleable (laughs) adolescent brain can be magic. It can be a really important time to have a positive influence on young people and their identity. Yeah, I mean, that's that's mentorship, right? I mean, that's, you know, and I think p- higher achievement, you call the people that, that show up after school mentors. Mentors, right? you have a yeah. mentor program. Talk to us Yeah, about so we have, um, we serve 500 middle school students and each of our students is um, paired with two adult volunteer mentors from the community. And our mentors are a range of people. They are not teachers. In fact, we say you do not have to be a teacher to be an effective mentor. Mentors can be anywhere from um, college students to senior citizens and anywhere in between. We have working professionals, um, folks who are retired, folks who are in school as college students. And those volunteers agree to um, work one day a week with a small group of middle school students, three or four middle school students. And they um, mentor them. They get to know them as individual people. Um, and they provide uh, academic mentoring. So we have a curriculum and they work with them on either math or English language arts as mentors. And they really use what they get to know about their young people, what excites them, what frustrates them, what are they interested in, how can we use social media to get to know them better, and really help um, either open up doors of academic achievement or support sparks of curiosity that we hope will help carry young people through their entire middle school experience. So the mentors are a really big part of, you know, we have a curriculum, but then we have volunteers who show up. It's not mom or dad. It's not a teacher. It's not even a staff member. It's a person from the community who's showing up every week for an hour to get to know you, who cares about you, who notices if you don't show up, who asks about home, who asks about school. Um, And for young people, like so much of what they want in middle school is to like talk about themselves and explore themselves and to really figure out what lights them up is the power. It's like the magic of having a mentor who, you know, you can confide in and then hopefully who also has opportunities to show you what was their college or career path? What kind of career are they in? How did they decide? What made them excited about it? What did they like in school? What did they excel in? What was a challenge for them? And just having someone else to talk to, oftentimes besides mom or dad or teacher. Well, that's what really I was going to, do you think it helps that it's not a parent and that it is someone else? Like, do you, do you think that kids, especially at that age, need need an adult person or a mentor that's not, you know, not related to them, that's not part of their their family I think so. Don't we all? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I mean, I think I need that even still. I'm I'm 42 and I appreciate having. You still have mentors now? Like, has that just been a thing that you've practiced? Like you've had it, you know, you used your teachers as a mentor, it sounds like in in your, in your younger years. And then as you've 
gone about? Like, how does that work for you? I think what's been really impactful for me has been professional mentors. So in my careers, I've built my career over the 20 years. I've absolutely had a handful of colleagues, oftentimes supervisors or like a near peer, someone a little more senior in their career who has shown me the wings, who has let me or shown me the way, has let me ask questions, has given me advice, who I've asked for, can you observe me? Can you give me feedback that you know, I might not otherwise get, or I'm trying to get to this next step in my career and I can ask really um, direct and, you know, candid questions to and ask for it and receive feedback. Were you always open to asking for help like that? Or did you have to learn how to do that? I, I find that some people there, cause that's a vulnerable thing, right? Cause we have this concept or this thing, this idea about us that like, if I can't figure it out on my own, then I'm somehow flawed that we, we sort of view other people that are successful or doing things as always having been that way. Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know that I could point to just one person, but I do think that um, perhaps that hesitancy to ask for help or ask for advice could be a particularly gendered uh, perspective. Mm. I actually do think that women and one of the strengths of female leadership is I do think that we not only are able to ask for advice and feedback, that we view asking for help as a sign of a good leader. We can't all know everything. I don't think women judge other people for asking for help, um, for learning from mistakes, mm. from improving. Mm. Um, progress is a good thing. So I do think as women and women's leadership in particular, um, there is a flavor of human, the human quality of people. Leaders aren't perfect. Um, and in fact, I value leaders who admit that they're not perfect and seek uh, resources, seek advice. In each stage of my career, I have, you know, I, I would, I think one thing that has been true and that has been helpful for me as I've built my career is I, I do think I've been always unapologetically ambitious. And I do think that there are lots of messages that young women get, that women of color in particular get, that being ambitious is either wrong or it's something that I shouldn't be explicit about. Is that, do you, like, is that a direct message or like anyone, like what, what, how does that come about? I think about? it's like sometimes it's... direct and indirect. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I what think. What are some of those indirect ways, right? I think that's how we, if we can identify those, right. And, and, and I've, I've gotten this from some of the female guests, which is, I've like, the, I think, you know, one of the ways that we can we can work towards change. We're not going to be able to shame each other into better behavior, just like we can't self-deprecate ourselves into better behavior. But if we can talk about some of the indirect ways, like what, you know, I think, I think, yes, every woman in a professional setting, and I don't even take it back to school. I think every girl slash woman has had, um, moments in which the message has been received that it's, you know, it, it, it's better well received to be polite and, careful and to make other people feel comfortable than it is to be direct and ambitious and, you know, toot your own horn. I think that has been, that's a, that's a pretty consistent. I think that's still true. I, I'm a mom. I, I raise daughters. I have two girls myself. I, I think that's, that's still something that we have to work actively against. So how did you overcome that? Or did you have someone in your life to, to champion that or, or to show you the way of, of, that you can think of or how did you yeah how did you become who you are like how do you do <laughs> i don't know that's a really that's a good question i don't i don't know that there's no i don't think there's any one person well, what I are think, you telling your daughters i mean you've got to be coaching them somehow so my mom was my mom um my mom did not work outside of the home when i was younger and i do to your point about mentors linking it back to mentors um i my mom taught me all kinds of things how to be um an openly ambitious and direct and successful person in the workplace is something that I had to look outside of the home as a woman okay. to look outside of the home to find. So this is going to sound silly, but when I was younger, I was obsessed with Oprah. I still am. What I would Oprah do? <laughs> what would Oprah do is a really common refrain. I'd ask myself, particularly in high school and in college, what would Oprah do? Oprah is, was still is, but in particular, as I was younger, um, that was my role model. I don't know her, but she was my role model for this is what a successful, um, unapologetically ambitious, yet kind and mission conscious professional woman looks and sounds like. This is what it looks like. And I think 
right there's a for me i you know you asked um early on kind of what what landed me in this line yeah. of work right I, I was openly ambitious i also really wanted to do mission driven work education was really important in my life in terms of um opening the path to career success and I recognized that I had opportunities because of education that many young people don't have. And so it was really important to me that my work be mission driven and to look for role models who are able to put those things together, to be ambitious, to be um, mission driven and to put those together in a way that made the world a better place, a more fair place, a more inclusive place, a place that says yes to all kinds of young girls, uh, regardless of what their career interests are. So, I, you know, that's an example of not a mentor that I know personally, but, but someone who has, um, I think, put those things together and gave us permission. Gave, you know, it's like one example of giving permission because I could see her, I could be her, right? It was an opportunity yeah. to model, to, to like have permission to be those things together. Ambitious mission driven and a woman and a yeah. woman of color in the work. Yeah. I mean, that's impactful because I don't think, you know, even I follow certain people and I, I read certain books and certain authors and, and in a way I'm using them as mentors. We don't have an actual relationship with them. I don't know them. I mean, I do think that was one of the magic pieces of Oprah and, and, and talk about technology using television to come into our homes. I certainly felt like I knew her. And I think that was part of her appeal, right? She, she taught, she, we felt like she was our friend Yeah. while she was being wildly successful. Do you guys make suggestions of who, like the young folks that you're, you're mentoring and that you're teaching with the uh, uh, higher achievement could follow or could listen to or books to read and things oh, to kind yeah, of Oh yeah, absolutely. I feel like they give us lots of suggestions as well. You know, I mean, I think one of the things we, one of the, one of the key um, kind of tenants at higher achievement is that we are scholar forward. We call our students scholars. So that scholars are at the center of what we do. They're at the center of how we design our programming, how we recruit and train our mentors, how we train our own staff. We do it with young people and adolescents in mind, in particular young people of color in mind. So we do try to balance, um, here's who I think would be really motivating to you with who is motivating to you, 13 year old, 12 year old, who are you listening to? Who do you follow? Like, why is that somebody that you're excited about? And then try to point out um, or highlight and lift up the reasons why that m music artist, that activist in your community, the principal or the counselor, or the guy on your block who like knows every single person and make sure every kid has, you know, a sandwich and a meal after school, why those people are leaders in the different kinds of community leaders that it doesn't just have to be Oprah, right? It can be the people who you know every day. It is the people that you, the th young people, they already, they already have examples of leaders and, um, change makers in their lives and really trying to highlight what is it about them? What did it take for them to get there? How do you connect that to how you're showing up every day in school? So, you know, I think we try to balance telling them and, and, and showing that the ones they've already identified, um, have a lot of the qualities and really trying to break it down. Uh, for what example, we just did a big, um, virtual event, um, our first virtual gala and we highlighted and had two amazing Black Lives Matters activists speak directly to our scholars, DeRay McKesson and Brittany Packnett Cunningham. These are two, um, you know, millennial generation young people of color who are activists in, in the movement, who are former educators themselves. They spoke directly to our scholars. And I think one of the most important parts of both of their messages was that our young people don't have to wait until they are grownups, right? That there's not some future state in which they will be leaders and able to use their voices for change. They really did highlight the moment is now you as young people, as middle school students have a voice, you have a perspective and you have the ability to make an impact that because you are young, because you are brown, because you live in the DC area, that is a both a position of power and a perspective and a voice that's worth um, people hearing now and that you can use your voice today, right now, not tomorrow, today in seventh grade, in eighth grade. Um, and that is just such a validating message. I, I feel like that's very different than for many of us when we were in school. It was always about a future state. When I grow up, when I'm in high school, when I'm in college, when I have the job, when I have the title. And this was very much about using your voice today and that that, that in and of itself is worthy and able to cause to make big change. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible that you guys are fostering that at such a young age. 
But it does it. So you're you're focused on the middle school. How, how far does it go? What to what age? Yeah, thanks it... for that. We do. We work with middle school students, fifth through eighth grade now, and we um, obviously we support them academically and social emotionally while they're in middle school. But all of the work we do builds towards success in eighth grade understanding their high school landscape. Um, today, high school is not as simple as walking up to the school that you are zoned for in your neighborhood. There's all kinds of choices, and with that choice comes the need to educate the young people and their families about what the choices are, how to match to a great high school. It's very similar to how many of us applied for college. We had to do all kinds of research around rigorous colleges. Young people, middle school students are expected to do that now for to match to a great high school. So all of the work we're doing in middle school is to help students make and understand and transition to a, wrong, a strong and rigorous high school with the understanding that a rigorous high school is one of the best next steps or one of the best pathways into a strong college experience or, or post-secondary college or whatever comes after high school. So we really are working towards a strong high school transition and we're really proud that we track our middle school students in high school and 95% of the students that we work with in middle school, our alumni go on to graduate from high school on time. And the reason that 95% high school graduation rate is something we're very proud of is because here in the DC area and DC in particular, the average high school graduation rate is under 70%. I think last year it was about 65%. In some parts of the city, the high school graduation rate is more like 50% based on race and based on income. So the lower income the community, the lower the graduation rate, high school graduation rate at many of the schools. And so when our students are living in a, a community in which the average high school graduation rate is 50%, we're particularly proud that our students are graduating at the 95% rate. That's just such a crazy statistic, thinking that this is, you know, it's the United States of America. It's a first world country. But not only that, it's our nation's capital. It's our nation's this capital. Is... And there's so much wealth right here in the city. And so, yes, that disparity between wealth, between, you know, the wealth gap um, shows up right at the beginning from the high school graduation rate. And it is both unfair, it's unjust, and it is part of the work that we and so many of our nonprofit peers are, are working on across the city. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you definitely sound like you have a passion for it. Do you, do, would you say that you're fulfilled every day with what you're doing? The best moments, for sure. I spend a lot of time, you know, the, the more senior, I think this is true for many folks, the more senior I get um, in my career, the less directly I'm working with the actual young people that we're yeah. serving. So much of the work is external or administrative or managing the people who are actually working with young people. But the best moments in my job, for sure, are the opportunities to actually interact with the students that we serve, to hear from them and their families directly, to see our staff and our, our students in action, our scholars in action um, during session. That's always the best. You know, I can go a week or two without seeing one of those sessions and then pop in. And even in a virtual world during during the pandemic, we, we, have, we are doing virtual programming. So we're delivering all of our sessions. We're still seeing our young people every week via Zoom. Um, and to be able to sit in and hear them talk about the election or to talk about health care disparities, to talk about education disparities and thinking about high schools and how to pour through stats on high schools, who is graduating students, who is graduating students that look like me, are students going to college? Is that something that I want to really have critical conversations about? Why isn't it the case that every high school in this city, no matter which one I choose, could help get me to college? And why are there disparities? And why are the ones who are who have the lower graduation rates clustered in my neighborhood, in my ward, in my community. So to hear students have those critical conversations and to get to observe young people being thoughtful, thinking about their place and their futures is for sure the most gratifying part of my work. Yeah. Now you said something in there that really, so at, you know, with, with the DC local leaders, a lot of what our conversations are around are making that transition for a lot of people, you know, either going from something technical to a leadership role uh, or in like your case, where you're directly impacting the, the young people because you're working with them day to day, and then having the transition into more of a leadership role within the organization to further that mission. So still important work, but very different. How did you make that transition? How did you know you were ready to do that? You know, and what is what is that like? What What's that process like? I'm sure it's... So yes, what I do today is very different than teaching first grade <laughs> in the Bronx every day. I'm not in the classroom um, or in the after school session day to day. I think, as I said, again, I've always been um, ambitious. And for me, ambition meant that each year, every five years, I was setting goals for what was next in my personal career path. 
in the classroom, for example, I am able to impact, or I was able to impact 30 students, 30 first grade students each year and, and, and their families. When I moved into the nonprofit space, I was able to work with an entire school or sets of schools. And it was very lovely to have the work that I was doing impacting an entire school system or multiple school buildings. Uh, I, I spent some time in my career at the in the central office at DC public schools, so within school systems. And then, of course, you're looking out across an entire school system, a whole city, and multiple buildings of schools and teachers and families. So, um, I think for me, as I think about goals, when I originally started in this work, it was to make a difference, to impact young people and their families and access to educational opportunity. So it has been helpful to think about how can I, at each stage of my career, expand how many people or the geographic location or the reach that I can help put my skills to use to help close that opportunity gap. Um, and each time that has taken me, you know, a little further and further away from, you know, one classroom at a time. So I do think being able to set goals around how can I increase the impact that I'm having personally, how can I use my skills to increase impact in a particular city or industry has helped me set those goals. And I ended up going to graduate school. I went back to graduate school, got a master's degree, and I did set my sights on becoming an executive director. So after working in multiple nonprofits from different vantage points, I worked in the fundraising side, I've worked in the direct program side. An executive director role was the role that I settled on that was a really great opportunity to bring those skills together, to have direct service opportunity, like to have direct service experience, to have fundraising experience, and then pull them together to, as you said, talk about the work, to further the mission, to bring resources to the organization that could help us serve more students, hire more staff, deliver better curriculum, work better with families and communities. So the role itself has been a really great, um, it was a good goal to set on to pull all of my experiences together. Now, the things you did before this, leading up to this, did you pick those on purpose because you knew that they would give you a skill set to do this? Or did you did you feel like you were just guided? Or is it only retroactively you're looking back? No, I was, to see, pre I was know, pretty systematic. <laughs> you knew that that's what you wanted. So anyone yeah. who wants to to have a career similar to yours or who believes in a mission, whether it's higher achievement or something, you, what advice could you give? It sounds like you had a plan. What is that plan? Like how, how could they do it? I would say, I won't say it is true that almost every executive director role of a nonprofit organization, fundraising experience, the opportunity or the experience to generate revenue, to understand how the revenue generation side of a nonprofit, um, the needs and, and the fun the like kind of function area of generating revenue, fundraising experience is critical. So I think for many people, you know, we might start on the direct service side, we are on the programmatic side, we are delivering the services, creating the programs, managing the volunteers. Um, and that's very critical to understand, you know, the, the impact of the work. Who are you serving to understand the program area, how to evaluate good programs, how to deliver good programs, how to hire staff. The program side is really important. And because we are a nonprofit, we are a 501c3 um, industry, that means we operate on fundraising. We have to raise the funds to operate our budget, uh, to operate our, our organizations each year. So fundraising experience is often the place that, you know, to be a successful ED, you have to be able to build those skills and oftentimes fundraising in a variety of settings. So being able to work with individuals to understand how grants work and working with big foundations to understand government grants, whether it's local or federal. So right, not just any fundraising experience, but a range of fundraising experience is often the most critical for um, being able to pull up and, and help you know, create budgets, generate budgets, and, and manage staff who are fundraisers, revenue generators for your organization. So my advice would be both things are important. So, um, you know, I said many times people start on the program side and they need to gain the fundraising experience. The flip is often true as well. I think executive directors who have only a revenue generation or only an external background, um, oftentimes have a hard time connecting to the programmatic side of the work to understand what it means to, and, and what you need to deliver strong programs, to support staff, uh, to really understand the, con the constituents and like the, the, um, the ecosystem that you're actually operating in. So I think the program side and the fundraising side are both really important, I think, to be a successful ED in, 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 in any small to mid to large size nonprofit. What kind of work or is higher achievement doing on a on a policy level or lobbying level? Are you guys making efforts and working with like DC Public Schools and the mayor and things like that to kind of help uh, further your mission there as well? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, because we because we are an education nonprofit, we do work in school systems. And at this point, Higher Achievement in D.C. works across three school systems. We're working in D.C. public schools, we're in Alexandria City public schools, ACPS, and Prince George's County public schools, PGCPS, not to mention the charter schools in the city as well. So um, that is also another, you know, another piece of advice I think I would offer is it does require, I think, a level of sophistication for an organization to work not just in one school system, but across multiple, and they are really different. Um, and part of that partnership is both understanding how those school systems work and then to your point, um, being thoughtful um, and collaborative with both school systems, but I think also other peer organizations. We, you know, DC is a city. There are um, almost 100,000 students in the school system here and we have so many nonprofit peers in the after school space and in the education space who are working in the same space we are in that after school, in the after school hours, in the youth development, um, or the academic support um, work. So, you know, we serve 500 middle school students of a 100,000 school system. So we have so many peers who are working with the younger students who are our students before they come to middle school, who take over and work in the after school space when their students are in high school, and they're also working on that college pipeline work. So I think for us, advocacy is both knowing our school system, but also knowing our nonprofit peers and working arm in arm with them. Um, and so we do work in, in a lot of advocacy um, efforts that are focused on helping the city uh, remember, prioritize, um, keep front of mind that out of school time is often critically important to a school system strategy around academic outcomes, that out of school time isn't just an education strategy, it's a youth development strategy, it's also um, helping young people uh, be thoughtful about their um, their pathways to work and how they're using their time to build experiences and their resumes to be more employable in the future. So, you know, we, we live in a space, it's not just education, there's all kinds of smart reasons to invest in young people during the school day as well as out of school time. And so we do we do have advocacy efforts that help remind city council, um, school district leaders, city leaders um, to fund out of school time programs, to think about young people after school hours, to be thoughtful about um, creating opportunities for young people that are not just academic. So that's arts programs and sports programs and city rec centers, all of the things that we know young people need to be um, to be successful young people, but also to be you know productive um, members of our, our city community. Yeah. Yeah. And all of those things. I'm a, you know, I, I, I played sports when I was younger. You, you just, I guess I don't, I can't even count on, on, I can think of lists of people that looking back, maybe I didn't call them mentors at the time because I didn't have that vocabulary. I wouldn't have known that that's what they are in my life. But many of them came not just from people in school, right? It was playing sports. It was coaches. It was other people and stuff. So many so, of us find confidence, right? That shows up in school, but we find it outside of school time, not during the you know, right. 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And back to that story about my brothers, you know, there's so much about where they found success that didn't come during the traditional school day from sports programs. For one brother, it was the arts, um, you know, technical programs that happened after 3 p.m. So you're totally yeah. right. There's so many reasons to invest in young people all the time in our community. Right. Um well, yeah. Well, you know, this has all been fantastic stuff. If someone wanted to get in touch with Higher Achievement and they wanted to participate, whether it was at a mentorship level or a sponsorship level, I know that we just had the, the event, not the gala. Um, um, you know, how could they reach you? What's the best way to get in touch with Talia, grab coffee and figure out how we can you know, make something work. Here. Absolutely. Well, we are always looking for volunteer mentors. So if you're looking to volunteer, even during COVID, even during the pandemic, we still have that virtual volunteer opportunities that you can do from home. Um, so please go to our website, higherachievement.org, and you can click on become a mentor to fill out an application. It's really quick and we will pair you um, with the school and on a night that makes sense for you. So we're always taking volunteers. And then for myself, you can reach me at twashington at higherachievement.org. I'm happy to talk with anybody about the work we do, whether it's you're personally interested in higher achievement or want to talk more about the nonprofit world and the executive director role. I'm always interested. I talked with so many people on my path uh, to this role for sure. Yeah. Well, that's, thank you for saying that, right? Because I think a big part of 
what what we here at DC Local Leaders hope to achieve is that we someone listening to this can find value, and we never know where that is, right? Maybe it's someone who's looking for something to participate in. Maybe it's a fellow leader of a nonprofit that does advocacy or that does some other type of work that they just need a colleague or a mentor, someone like you to be around. Or, you know, really, it's I'm fresh out of school. I've got this desire to to work in some sort of space like nonprofit or teaching or something and I just need someone to talk to that has good advice. Um, I am I me. I feel very passionately about um recruiting and keeping talented people in the nonprofit field. There are so many reasons why people might um think twice about make, can I make a career working in the nonprofit space like I care about kids or care about a particular mission, but, you know, maybe I should just do that as a volunteer project versus making that my nine to five job. And there's so many reasons why you absolutely can make a wonderful career in life out of doing this work full time. And we need talented people. So I'm very passionate about talking with anybody who's really wrestling with, is this a volunteer part of my life or is this my full time work and how can I make it work? I'd be very happy to talk. Thanks for listening to DC Local Leaders. We'd love to connect with you. Find us on LinkedIn and YouTube by searching DC Local Leaders, on Instagram at DC Local Leaders, or our website, dclocalleaders.com. You can find the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google, or wherever you find great podcasts. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you're a business leader and have questions on your lease and how it impacts your business's opportunities to grow or have questions about the market, you can reach Philip directly at philip.natrum at transwestern.com. He'd love to speak with you. Until next time.